Well, hey, everybody. How you doing? My name is Jason, one of the pastors around here, and I just want to say welcome and so glad that you are here to everybody who is watching online. Everybody's a part of this service at Noda, at Ballantyne, South Park, South Boulevard, Waxhaw, and Fort Mill. Thrilled that you are here, and I want to start by giving just a great big shout out to you for what you just saw in that video. Because you guys, last two weekends ago, the first time ever, Forest Hill Church in all of its locations on one day came together and served our communities, unleashing compassion and generosity. I mean, the love of Jesus was embodied, it was demonstrated, it was spoken, and that's what it looked like, is what you just saw. People from all ages, walks of life, all ethnic backgrounds, all of us as one church making this huge impact all over our communities. And what's so cool about that to me is as one church, we are having an impact in, on that one day, May 23rd, in two states, three counties, multiple different ages and towns. I mean, it was just phenomenal. And that is who we are. We are people who have experienced the love of God. We've been changed and affected by it. And then we become conduits to just spill it out and overflow on everybody else. So I wanna say thank you and let's keep doing it. Let's keep staying out. And the next thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna get a chance to come together to worship as one community in just a couple of weeks. Uh, June 19th at the South Park campus, we're gonna gather every campus together for one worship night. Never happened before in our history. And what we're gonna do in that time is have people who are excited about what God is doing in their lives, who is excited about what God is doing in their community, what he's gonna do in the future. And I think if you put that many people together in one room, to just worship and tell God how good he is, to sing and pray and be a community, who knows what might happen. So go ahead and take your phone out and you can log into your calendar right now, put down that date, June 19th. While you have your phone out, you may wanna keep it out and, and if you use that as your scripture, go to Matthew 20. That's what we're gonna be looking at in just a couple of minutes. But I am thrilled for what's happening here and mostly because of who you are. We are finishing up a series in the next couple weeks that we've been in called The Escape Room. And, and the series has been looking at those places in life that can trap us, that, that can keep us from experiencing the abundant and full life that, that Jesus offered. And it's been helpful for you guys. If you, you found some, whether it was talking about anxiety or performance, Jonathan did the last couple of weeks, fantastic messages. I hope that it's been impactful for you. Um, and, and if you've wanted to go back and catch up on those, do that on the website. But also we do this thing called Digging Deeper. It's a podcast every Monday after the sermons are done. And we uh, interview somebody on staff and we talk a little bit more in depth in the ways that you can't quite do in just a 30 minute sermon uh, about the, the issue at hand. And it's a fantastic way for you to grow more, for you to share with other people. So I encourage you to take a look at that. But today we are continuing by talking about the trap of comparison. And comparison is one of those tricky ones because you can actually be stuck in a mindset and a habit of comparison and not really even know what it's doing to you because it just seems so natural and normal in our world, right? I mean, whole industries are built on this idea of comparing. Comparing is a part of the way that we grow up as kids to learn our identity. As, as parents, we teach our kids, you know, you're this, you're not that, you're a boy, not a girl, you're a girl, not a boy, whatever it is. We use comparison as a way to form identity. So it's, it's natural. And then you get out into the world of social media like we live in, and all of our culture is just compare, compare, compare. It's never been easier. It's never been more deadly to fall into the trap of comparison. And, and you know how this happens. You start out your day, and it's a good day. You wake up, you get in your car, it starts the first time. It's full of gas. You drive it to your job that they still let you in the front doors with. They're still sending paychecks for. And you take your lunch, you stick it in the break room refrigerator. Say hi to Jared, your, your coworker who's now become a good friend as you go sit back down at your desk. I mean, all in all, in the first hour and a half of your day, you have a home, a car, gas, a job, food, and a friend which is quite a bit compared to most of the people who've ever lived in the world. But then that little buzz happens on your phone and it's the push notification from Instagram. And it's that friend that is always posting the pictures of their vacations or their car 
or their day at the office with the little feet like in front of the camera leading out to the pool. You know what I'm talking about? Does anybody tell me that you don't do that? Like the feet thing. That's just weird. But anyway, you get that notification. Suddenly you're comparing your life to somebody else's and everything that was so good about your life 10 minutes ago suddenly doesn't seem to measure up, right? And, and it goes farther than that because it's, it's not just that you're, you know, measuring or comparing your life to theirs. Um, you're, you're not just comparing that moment. You're comparing your house and your job and your vacation and, and everything about it. And the way that the trap of comparison grabs us is this. We look at other people's things, their marriage, spouse, vacation. And we look at ours and then we decide how we're going to feel about our own based on what theirs looks like. That's when you know you're stuck in a trap of comparison. And every time we do that, it makes us feel either prideful or jealous. You feel superior or inferior. This is a no-win game. There's not a middle ground here. Each time we fall into this comparison game, you are going to feel better than or worse than whoever it is you're comparing to. And the, the weird thing is, is even though we know this, our comparisons are almost never apples to apples, right? I mean, we're, we're comparing what I call the show versus what we know. So somebody else has got the show out there and it's, it's the best that they could put out. It's their highlight reel that you compare to your outtakes. It's their best 10% compared to your 100%. You know what I'm talking about? Like, like, have you ever seen this on maybe an Instagram feed or something where you're looking through, you're scrolling through pictures and, and maybe you felt okay about, you know, your pet owner skills, but then you see this from, you know, obedience skills. Like you, the picture is, shows you how bad you should feel about your dog. But then when you kind of pan out and see what they did there, I mean, really? Or maybe it's, it happens with our kids. We compare them all the time too, you know? I mean, look, my kid, you know, she's six. She can't even tie her shoes yet. This kid can do a handstand already. But then the truth is that that's what's going on. You know how this thing works. Or the people who post those pictures of the gorgeous sunrise or they're waking up to a world that you could only possibly imagine. And, and you look out your window to the view that you have, and it's just not the same. But, but in reality, you know, what it is that this sunrise is a part of is maybe a trash heap. It's the junkyard of someone's life that you can't see 100% of, but you compare yours to them. Anybody know what this comparison trap feels like? There's some research that had been done by psychologists. And in an article uh, that was written and kind of summarized in so Psychology Today, it talked a little bit about this trap. And it's funny, the, the article was specifically focusing on Facebook and other social media. And it talked about how um, social comparison has become an addiction. And here are what the, the author said. He said, social comparisons are always a me versus you game. They're never a me and you or a me with you. It's me versus you. It's a powerful drug because it promises superiority. So why do people compulsively use a thing like Facebook or Instagram, which makes them miserable? Because we have become addicted to social comparison. We, instead of forming genuine relationships, we perform comparisons, we build pecking orders, we seek validation. And what happens is we are unable, according to these psychologists, to open ourselves up, appreciate others, and be intimate with them. But those are the things that it takes to form real relationships. We're actually training ourselves as a culture to be unable to have real, genuine, quality relationships with people because of the comparison trap. And there's no group that feels the weight of this more than students right now, right? Students, there's a popularity for metric uh, or a popularity metric that exists now that didn't exist when, when I or anybody older than me was growing up. You know, at that point, it was just who got the picture in the yearbook as most popular. But now every single day, every single minute, likes, retweets, shares, follows, uh, streaks, all of those things are constantly telling students where you line up in the world of popularity. And you can't go to a party without thinking of, should I post this picture? Because my friend didn't get invited and that's gonna make her feel bad. I mean, you guys, those of you who are students, you've got so much more pressure on you than I can possibly imagine. I mean, when I was growing up, I would only find out if I didn't get invited to the party, like on Monday, you know, in the cafeteria, if somebody happened to be talking about it, you know instantly that you're not in and it's killing us. 
So I want to talk to you real briefly and simply about how to break out of the comparison trap. Because I interviewed some students and some adults this week, asking them about this comparison thing. And I asked these questions. Do you ever feel depressed when you start to look at social media, compare yourselves? 100%, yes. You ever feel angry? 100%, yes. You think this is healthy? 100% said no. And this is fascinating. I asked, especially the younger people, if I could tell you how to stop feeling that way, would you give it up? 100% said no. It's just a part of our world. And so what we've got to do is learn where we find our worth and value and identity. And it's not in the popularity metric. So before I, I tell you how to get out of it, I want to talk to you about the root of comparison. Because this is not a new thing. This has been going on since the very beginning. Cain and Abel, the first murder in humanity's history happened over this comparison idea. Cain didn't like the way God viewed Abel's sacrifice. He was upset, compared himself, and he killed his brother. But it, but it started even before that. It's Eve in the garden comparing what it is that she has, what God is already giving her uh, to what it is that she wants. The one thing that he said was off limits. See, see, here's the thing. Comparison, the root of it is actually the same seed as rebellion. The, the root of comparison, the, the reason it's so dangerous is because actually what comparison is, it is springing from a lie about who God is and what we deserve from him. When you get all the way down to the bottom, it's not just about the other person. It's about why do they have this? Why has God allowed that or given that? And why do I not? So God knew that this would happen and he built in a rule with his people, the Israelites, early on in the big 10, you know, the 10 commandments, he lays out here are the ways that you live. One of those rules is about how to avoid this trap. It's found in Exodus 20, verse 17. And he says this, last, last one of the 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's house you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. In, in those days, this would be uh, where he lived, who he was married to, the wealth that he had, how he made his wealth, his purpose in life, all of it. God said, hey, if you're gonna be my people, here's the way we're gonna live. You're not gonna covet or compare and lead it to envy of someone else's anything. Really simple. But none of us can stop doing it. And God knew that. So I'm going to tell you three ways that you can get out of this comparison trap. But before I do, I want to read you this story. It's found in Matthew 20. It's a little snippet of Jesus' life towards the end. And he's been teaching his disciples about the, the meaning of life, the, the purpose of why they're here, what the kingdom is. He's talked to them about how they're to be servants. They're to express love to those who are around them in the same way that Jesus would. And, and they're doing this little walking seminar, right? And as they're walking along, he tells them the story. It's called a parable. And a parable is a kind of a made up story that's got a meaning in it that sometimes are uh, tough to figure out. And other times it's really clear. And, and I'll let you decide on this one. It says this in Matthew 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and then sent them into his vineyard. A denarius would be um, a regular day's wages, like a fair amount to be paid for a day's work. N nothing extravagant, but, but not minimum wage either. Just what you would expect to earn. So six in the morning, the vineyard owner calls some people and says, hey, come work for me. About nine in the morning, he went out and he saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, hey, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. Doesn't give him a specific amount. Doesn't say the denarius. He just says, I'll be fair. And so they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and he did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and he found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Uh, because no one is hired, as they answered. He said to them, will you also go and work in my vineyard? When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, hey, call all the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers, who were hired about five in the afternoon, at the end of the workday in this time would be about 6 p.m., 
The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius, an hour's worth of work for a full day's wage. So when those who came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. Think about it. They started work at 6 a.m. The 5 o'clock p.m., guys, they got a full day's wage. Oh, can't wait to see what we're going to get. I mean, this is going to be amazing. He told us he'd pay us a denarius, one day's wage, but, but man, it's got to be so much better than that. Those who were, uh, when they received it, they began, oh, sorry. The workers who were hired at five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. And so when those who came were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one also received a denarius. Wait a second. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only an hour, they said, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. These guys worked for 60 minutes. We were here for 12 hours and you're paying us the same? But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? And then Jesus says this last line, which almost feels like it doesn't fit. He says, so the last will be first and the first will be last. Now this parable, it's certainly talking about how they got paid. What they received was by grace. Uh, You could argue that all of them had to work for it. Some worked a long time, some worked a little. All of it was, was a job they didn't have when that day started. So grace was given to each of them. And when we experience grace, when we experience God inviting us into the kingdom, it doesn't matter how hard we've worked, how long we've waited or how short. He says, all of you get the same thing, eternal life, forever with me, purpose and abundance. But But there's a part of the story that's not just about grace. And the reason that I know this is because bracketing this story, Jesus is talking to his disciples about comparing to each other. See, all of those early workers, they got enough, they got enough for their day. Enough to buy some food for their kids and take care of their clothing budget, whatever it was, pay the rent. They had enough to be content. And isn't it funny for you and me too, how even when we have enough to be content, as soon as we look at somebody else's stuff, ours starts to not look so good. I mean, when you didn't have a job, just getting a job sounded amazing. But then you get a job and you see somebody in another tier and it's like, did they actually, I mean, come on. I work harder than them. Isn't this the way we do? I mean, you don't have to raise your hand because, you know, we're all nice people in here in church and I don't want you to feel weird, but, but every single one of us inside knows we should be raising our hands right now. This is exactly the way we operate. Here's the thing, a pastor named Craig Rochelle says this and I love this phrase, the fastest way to kill something special is to compare it to something else. The fastest way for you to kill something special, your house, your job, your kids, your life, your wife, is to begin comparing it to something else. So in the story, Jesus, represented by the landowner, says these four words that are really pretty important for us to understand when we begin to get out of this trap of comparison. He doesn't say them explicitly in this story, but here's really what he says. So you don't like what they got and what you, you had enough. You could be content with that, but you don't like it. What's it to you? It's actually the words that Jesus uses a little later. Do you remember a few weeks ago, I talked to you about the story of uh, Peter being restored to Jesus. They're on the beach and he's made him breakfast. And at the end, Jesus goes through and he says, Peter, do you love me? Once for each time that he's denied him. And at the end, he says, follow me. Do you remember that story? Well, if you keep on reading in John 21, the next thing that happens is Peter gets up and starts walking after Jesus. And Jesus tells him something about the future. He says, Peter, you're gonna die. And here's how it's gonna happen. You're gonna become a martyr because of me. And Peter, who's just been restored to intimacy and relationship with Jesus. He turns around the first thing he does and he's like, he looks at John, he's like, oh, what about him? And Jesus actually says in John 21 there, what is that to you? This seems to be Jesus' way of dealing with our complaints about not having as much as somebody else. What's it to you? 
Why do you care? Haven't I given you everything that you needed? Do you not know that there may be something going on in the story behind the scenes with them that you don't understand that I want to treat and be generous to simply because I can be? Do you not know that there may be a deep wound that they have that I'm going to meet in this moment by allowing them to have something that, that you don't, but you have everything that you need and I love you. Why are you not content? What's it to you? So we finish the story because this blows my mind. Verse 17, Jesus was going up to Jerusalem and on the way, he takes the 12 aside and he says to them, we're going to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priest and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death. The son of man is Jesus. They'll condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. Here's the deal, guys. I, I know you're worried about who's getting what, but I'm about to go to the cross. I'm about to go pay the ultimate price to make sure that the, the gates and the entrance to heaven are open for you and everyone else forever. And it's gonna cost me everything. Guys, do you understand? This is why I want you to focus on the real mission here. Focus on the purpose. Here's the, the purpose of my life. And the purpose of yours right now is to walk with me and follow and support. Here's how it's gonna happen. And then he says on the third day, he'll, he'll be raised to life. And then get this. I mean, those are, those are pretty deep, heavy words, right? If somebody told you in that moment how they were about to die, you, you'd be paying attention. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. Guys, I'm about to go through the most excruciating thing the world has ever seen. Mom walks up with her two boys and kneels down in front of Jesus. Uh, Jesus, could I ask you a favor? What is it that you want, he asked. She said, I, I, I know the story that you just told about the cross and all that stuff, but but could you grant that one of my two boys may sit at your right hand and the other at your left when you're done with all that cross stuff? Like, that sounds bad for you, but, but, but my boys, I mean, compared to these other guys, like, these are really the two best ones. You know this, I know this, right? Let's go ahead and get the deal done so they can have their place. Now, she comes and kneels in front of Jesus. She's bringing him worship, but she's doing it to get something from him. And again, without raising your hand, because I'd raise mine too. Don't we do this sometimes? Don't we play games with God, walk through the steps of religion, of prayer, of worship, of trying to do something for him, all the while knowing that we just want something back from him? Have you ever thought, I wish I had that thing, maybe if I, if I just read the Bible a little more, if I just pray a little harder. I'm, I'm gonna go to church every day. Well, almost every day. I'm gonna go to church three out of four weekends. We, we do these things to try to manipulate, somehow use Jesus or God to get what it is that we want because we're stuck in a trap of comparing ourselves to others. And look, I don't think that it's wrong to want something, want the best for our kids. Nothing wrong with that at all. But when what you and I want for our kids, when the best for them actually distracts them from what God wants for them, and when it may divert them away from the path that he has them on, we actually do damage and destruction to our children. Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Uh, we can, the boys answered. The, the, drinking the cup simply means accepting the punishment, the wrath. It's a common way of, of saying that Jesus was going to have to uh, deal with all of God's wrath, go through this punishment. Are you going to be able to do that? And the boys are like, yeah, I think so. We've been hanging around with you for a while. We, we got it. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup. You will experience. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. What's it to you? These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. Now, last part of the story, get this. Jesus has told the parable. Moms tried to get her boys in. Jesus told about his death. When the 10, the other 10 friends, heard about this, they were indignant with the two. They're comparing against John, James and John, the other two. Everybody is comparing and can't believe that everybody else is trying to get something they don't have. Jesus called them all together. It's like, okay, huddle up. Enough with all this. Get down. Here, here's the way it's going to be. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. The way it works in the world out there is that the people with power have power over everybody else. They get what they want and the people lower on the rung don't, right? We all get that. 
So let's stop comparing, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus says, here's the way you're going to get out of this trap. You're going to live life like I do. You're going to serve. You're going to put others first. We're going to live upside down values in the world. That, that's how you and I as part of Forest Hill, how, how you as part of your neighborhood or your family, you as a dad or mom, this is how you're going to get out of this trap too, is you are going to learn to live like Jesus did by serving and honoring other people above yourselves. Because there's a cost to comparison. When you fall into this trap, it's going to cost you something. James 3.16 tells us a little bit about what this is. He says, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, all, all of the fruit of comparing, when that stuff happens, there you find disorder and every evil practice. This trap will lead to every evil practice if we don't break out of it. Here's what you lose. You lose contentment. Because where comparison begins, contentment ends. We lose the possibility of being content with what we have. The second thing that we lose are genuine, real relationships. Because you cannot be true friends with somebody. You can't experience that intimate relationship with someone and be their rival too. And you know how this happens. You won't say it. But it's that friend in the neighborhood whose vacation post you're looking at and, and you begin, you don't ever want to actually tell them the truth about your life anymore, right? You won't open up because you're afraid they're going to see that yours isn't quite as good or it's your brother-in-law that has that job. Some of us even leave careers we love and are good at and maybe we're called to do to chase another job because somebody else's life on the outside looks better because they have that job. We lose contentment. We lose relationships. And finally, this is the biggest one. You lose the chance to live God's unique story for you. Did you know that God's written a story about you? A, a, a screenplay with you in mind. It says it all over the scriptures. One place is interesting in Psalm 139, 16. If you ever struggle with whether you have purpose, teenagers, if you ever wonder if your life means anything, I want you to go to this verse. Psalm 139, 16 says this. Your eyes saw my unformed body all the days ordained for me were written in your book before even one of them came to be. Before you and I were even conceived, God had a story, a purpose, an adventure, a life of abundance written with you in it. And when you spend your time comparing to other people's life and trying to live to catch up or, or get in front of them, when, when I do the same thing and try to be someone else so that I can be as good as them, I miss out on what God wants to do in and with me. We miss his unique story. So, real quick, three practical things, how we're gonna escape the trap of comparison. First one I'm gonna call this, and it's keep your eyes on your own paper. And maybe that's just in my head because I got kids who are in school and it were EOGs this week. And it's like, there was a lot of thinking about testing. Uh, some of you, you don't remember those. And that is a really nice gift of God. But this is a stressful time. Keep your eyes on your own paper. Galatians 6, verse 4 says this. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. Paul says in writing this letter, basically, if you're going to compare, compare to yourself. C compare back to who you were last year. Don't compare to other people. Keep your eyes focused on your paper. So I want to give you this metric because here's the interesting thing. Um, the most important things in life, the most important things that we can succeed in, the most important things to have, they don't have good measurements like love, peace, patience. They don't, they don't come with denominational amounts. You can't add them all up and weigh them or measure them. They, you see them over time. So I want to ask you to do this. Keep your eyes on your own paper. Compare yourself to you last year in the big categories. Am I getting more forgiving? Am I growing more patient? Do I love 
naturally better. Compare yourself to only yourself. Second, run your race. Scripture often talks about this Christian life as being one of an athletic uh, endeavor. And the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, is talking about that. And he says this, and I think this is important to pull out this idea that we're running our race. Your, your race, not anybody else's. There's not a general race. There's a specific your race. He says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. All the comparison stuff, all the jealousy stuff, all the envy. Throw all that off and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And here's how you do it. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. See, everything that the disciples needed, everything that you and I need was in the middle of that story that I read to you from Matthew 20. When you keep your eyes fixed on the fact that Jesus Christ willingly looked at a cross and marched with unflinching resolve to the most gruesome death you could imagine, he did it staying fixed on your and my face so that in that moment, that death and, and the punishment that he would take would free us from the need to compare, free us from the need to earn or measure up. It would free us from the penalty of our sin. He did that. If, if you focus your eyes on that and you run out the race that he has for you, do what you're made to do. Get some godly advisors around and help you figure out what is my purpose? What's my unique contribution to the kingdom? If you fix your eyes on him in that way, you can't fail. But you got to keep your eyes on your own paper. You got to run your race. And finally, and this is where the juice is. All right, this is, this is the really good stuff. Celebrate and serve other people's success. The way you finally break the back of the comparison monster is you begin every time you get a notification that shows you somebody else's vacation you wish you had, instead of being like, God, how do they do that? I don't understand. They must have like stolen something or they're cheating on their tax or whatever. Instead of doing that, you celebrate what they got to do. And, and here's the key. You don't just celebrate inside, celebrate publicly out loud, verbally, on that platform, whatever it is, we begin to break the monster of comparison by celebrating where other people win, by considering them better than ourselves, and we serve their success too. That's what Jesus was saying. If you want to be first in my kingdom, if you want to win, talk about comparison, you want to win, serve better than anybody else. In Romans 12, he talks about outdoing each other with honor. What would happen if we became the kind of church, if we became the kind of people at every campus, every location, that spent our lives serving and out honoring everybody else? Can you imagine not just the freedom that would be found in other people's lives? As they saw that and said, how do you do it? Because I can't break out of this. We'd have so many opportunities to talk to them about the freedom in Christ that we have. But also, can you imagine the purpose and joy and contentment you would find in your own? If every day our job was to tell the story of what Christ has done and then serve people like it's true. That's how we get out of this comparison trap. So before I turn this over to the campus leadership uh, to close for a respond, I just want to tell you this one story. This week I was thinking about you know, it's all great to, to try to put into practice things, avoid the social media and all that stuff, but, but how does God feel about me? What, what do I really get? Because I sometimes feel like, and I don't know if you do, that, that I'm just trying really, really hard. I'm trying really hard to earn the way he feels about me. I know that's not right. I know I'm a pastor. I'm not supposed to believe that, but sometimes I feel it. And I got a chance to go to my little girl's preschool graduation this week. Don't laugh when you look at me and think I have a preschooler. And in the middle of that crowded room with all these people and all these other kids who have a story of their own and a life and a purpose, I had tunnel vision on one kid, on mine. And, and I could think about how much I love who she is and I love who she's gonna become. Folks, that's what God thinks and feels about you right now. You do not have to compare to anybody else. 
he couldn't love you more. He couldn't desire relationship with you more. So let's stop comparing. Let's stop missing the life that God has for us because we just keep looking at everybody else's life. Can we do that? I think we can. I think we can. Getting out of this comparison trap allows you to live the story that God wrote for you and to love the people that he loves. So you got some practical stuff. Take it, you can put it into practice today. Write a post as soon as you get out of here. And the first person who brags about their new car, you say, yeah, that is a great car. I love it too. So glad for you. Start to break the back of this. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that out of all of the silly things that can take our attention, things like social media and popularity contests, God, there's so many things that can distract us from the truth of what this life is all about. And I pray that, that knowing 2,000 years ago, there was none of this, this kind of platform or thing that was there, but you saw the future and you would tell a story about how to not compare, how to accept the grace we've all been given, how to find contentment in your love for us. You would tell a story that we could apply today. That, that boggles my mind. So thank you for loving us enough, not only to give us a formula for how to get out, but for providing the strength and the power in your death and resurrection that we can be transformed new people. Lord, I pray that for Forest Hill Church, we would be a place that would begin to crawl out of this and we would be so known for our love and honor for each other that it would be infectious. God, there are, there are people here that need to find freedom and peace tonight. They are so deep into this trap that they feel constantly depressed and in despair and inferior. And I pray right now you would speak life and love into hearts. For all of us, Jesus, give us eyes to fix on you, the author and perfecter of our faith, to imagine any of those times we compare ourselves to anything else. You stretched out, willing to give your very life and breath and blood for us. And let us live into that truth now. Thank you for this time and for these people. Thank you for this worship team and what we're about to sing that's true of you. We ask all of this, Jesus, in your strong and resurrected name. Amen.